great to see everybody here. So uh, good to be with you this Sunday morning as we continue to lift the name of Jesus high. I want to welcome everybody, as uh, Pastor Nick mentioned, that's watching online, maybe on our church app or uh, all our Facebook livers or live Facebookers or whatever that might be, but we're, gra- we're glad you're watching. Welcome to those that are in overflow. I'm so grateful that you're here. We're going to continue our series through the book of Hebrews called Jesus is Better. Jesus is better. We've been declaring that all year and saying that Jesus is better than everything and Jesus is better than anything. And uh, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I certainly hope that you do, please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Open up the, uh, your hard copy of your Bible, open up your Bible app, uh, whatever it might be, but go to Hebrews 10 and meet me at verse 26. We're going to pick up, as I mentioned, where we left off last week. In verse 26, and I'd like to uh, let you know before we dive into the passage for this morning, I want to give you a warning because the the text that we're going to be in this morning is pretty intense. Um, The text that we're going to be in this morning is is a hard text to to read, to hear, uh, to preach, um, all of the above. Uh, You'll see once we get into it what I mean, and uh, I want you to know that just because it's a hard text... That doesn't mean that we would go around it. That doesn't mean that we would ever skip it. We are preaching verse by verse through the book of Hebrews this year, and uh, we are not going to skip any parts of the Bible. If you've been here at any, uh, for any amount of time here at BT, you know, you know we don't skip parts of the Bible at BT. We teach and we preach the whole counsel of God. And there's a real danger whenever you come to places in the Bible that you don't like, that you tend to skip over or gloss over or altogether ignore you're doing yourself a dis- disservice because the fact that this is a hard passage is actually a blessing to us. It's a blessing to us because that means we're going to engage and we're going to encounter God's Word no matter what it tells us, no matter what it's saying to us. Um, and when we tend to skip the hard passages, what we're doing is we're not eating that balanced diet of God's Word that we need to, to be having so that we can be completely who He wants us to be. As a matter of fact, when you skip parts of the Bible, you get malnourished when it comes to the Bible edifying you and equipping you and growing you and so on. So we make sure that we, we, we want to make sure we don't become biblically poor. Amen? We don't want to be biblically illiterate when it comes to all of the passages of the Bible and particularly the hard passages of Scripture. And we know that when passages in Scripture uh, are, are the harder passages maybe to take in, to understand, that we always want to go to the rest of Scripture to help us understand what God is saying. L- let me clue you in on something. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, if God allows me the opportunity. And that is, whenever you are reading the Bible, whenever you are studying the Bible, whenever you're in a Bible study group, whenever you're in church in large group like this, When you engage the Bible and you read the Bible, one of the most dangerous questions you can ask is, what is the Bible saying to me? What is God saying to me? You never want to ask that question. That's a dangerous question. Instead, the question should be, what is the Bible saying? Or what is God saying in this passage? And then let me dig in, let me engage, let me investigate, and let me go to the rest of the Bible in the context of the Bible to see what he's saying in this passage. But whenever you add the to me at the end, what is God saying to me? What is the Bible saying to me? That's dangerous territory because you might be wrong in what God is saying. Amen? And that's why we want to have the correct interpretation and we want to engage all of Scripture to make sure that we truly understand what God is telling us. 
we want to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Amen? That's what we believe in here at BT, and that's what every preacher that is allowed to step on this platform believes, that we want Scripture to interpret Scripture. And that's what we're going to do today as we engage this passage. And I'm going to ask you to turn there with me in, um, in Hebrews chapter 10 as we dive in. And, and I want you to know that what we're about to read, um, this passage is one of three warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Like I said, it's pretty severe. It's pretty stern. Uh, the writer of Hebrews is emphatic as he wants us uh, to understand the dangers of playing around with God. He wants us to understand the dangers of having some form of knowledge of God, but never giving him our hearts, never truly surrendering to him. So we have a form of godliness, but we deny his power. Church, you know what I'm talking about? Okay? We can know Christianese. We can know the customs and traditions. I can look like a Christian, but my heart can be far from God. And if I'm going through the motions and I'm playing the games and my heart is far from God, I'm going to come to a very harsh reality that I'm going to be under the judgment of God. And that's what we're about to see in this text, because I want you to know there's all kinds of Christians in church, and that's how it should be. Not all kinds of Christians, all kinds of people. There's all kinds of people in church, and that's how it should be. Any Bible-believing, Jesus-fearing church that is sharing the gospel, that is teaching the scriptures, that is making disciples, is going to have all kinds of people in its chairs. I want you to think about that. Not only in our church, but in all churches that are gathered around the world today that are worshiping Jesus, there's all kinds of people sitting in the chairs. Every church is going to have some fully devoted followers of Christ. That's a great thing. These are mature Christians who are living as God wants them to, and they're, 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 they're passionate about the gospel. They're passionate about making disciples. They're fully devoted followers of Christ. But also in, a, in the chairs of every church, you're going to find those who are new to the faith, and they're growing in their faith. That's a beautiful place to be. Man, that, that stage of life where you're a baby Christian, you're new to the faith, and you're taking everything in, and, and the Bible is exploding, and it's a wonderful place to be. Every church should have its share of new Christians. Amen? That means you're sharing your faith. That means people are coming to know the Lord, right? Every church is also going to have in its chairs those who are going through the motions of their faith. So we've kind of already talked about that uh, you could be a believer, maybe not, but you could be a believer, but, but somehow you're in a dry season and you're just kind of going through the motions of their faith because also every church has in it people who are going through the motions who don't have faith in Jesus, but they're just going through the religious motions. And this is a game. It's a compartment of their life. It's something I have to do, but I don't truly believe. Then there are some that are going to be in our chairs who are searching for the truth and don't know Christ yet, but you're sincerely searching. And I'm glad you're here this morning because I got, I, I got this truth for you. If you're truly seeking the truth in your life, you're going to find him. It's not a concept. It's not a strategy. It's not a lesson. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. And if you're really seeking the truth, you're going to find him here. You're going to find him here. And then, quite honestly, there are those in our churches who don't want to be there. If we just are, are being flat out honest, you're here for some ulterior motive. You're here for some ulterior reason. You're here because somebody made you come here. If you had your choice, you'd rather be anywhere but here right now. I get that. I understand that. Uh, many of us have the testimony that I got dragged to church when I was younger. And I'm grateful for it now. I didn't like it at the time, but I'm grateful for it now. I'm grateful for the foundation that it had in my life. You might be here against your will. You might be here because you don't want to be. But I pray that even in that, you'll know that God has the power to work in your life and do something amazing. So I understand what that's about. When I first got serious about the things of God and got serious about getting discipled 26 years ago, I, I, I came upon this, this wonderful, faithful, Bible-believing, Jesus-fearing church here in McAllen called Emmanuel Baptist, and that's where I got discipled 26 years ago. I started getting serious about my faith. And Emmanuel Baptist had an amazing outreach program. Amazing outreach program. Her name was Michelle. And so I'd love to tell you that when I first started go going to church and, and getting serious about the things of God, it was because I was seeking Jesus and I wanted to know Jesus more. In reality, at first, it's because they had somebody named Michelle at that church. And uh, she became my wife. I married her. Amen. Praise God for that. Uh, but that was my first motivation for going. I'm grateful that God used that to get a hold of me and open my eyes and start discipling me. And that church was faithful to teach me the scriptures uh, because I floundered for five years, church. If you know my story at all, you know I've, I've shared with you 31 years ago I became a Christian, but it wasn't until 26 years ago that I started getting discipled. For five years, I floundered in my faith. For five years, I wavered in my faith, and I couldn't have told you why I believed what I believed. 
It wasn't until I started getting discipled. The greatest decision I've ever made in my life is to believe in Jesus for the salvation of my soul. But the second greatest decision I've ever made spiritually is to start getting discipled and learning the Word of God. That transformed my life completely. And I'm grateful for that faithful church that, that taught me the Scriptures and discipled me uh, so that I could understand what God wanted me to know for my life. And I, and I want us to understand this, that there's all kinds of people going through all kinds of journeys every time we meet. But what brings us together is the Lord Jesus and our faith in Him, our love for Him, and our worship of Him. And I want us to understand that the text that we're about to read is serious. And as harsh as it's going to be to hear, it is a loving warning from a loving God who's telling us there's another way, there's a better way, that Jesus is better. Amen? Go with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 26. This is what the Word of God declares. The writer of Hebrews says in verse 26, For if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. Adversaries means enemy, an enemy of God. That's literally what the word Satan means. Satan means enemy of God, adversary of God. And this is saying anybody who has rejected Jesus is an adversary of God. God loves you enough to tell you that if you reject him, you are an object of his wrath. You are his enemy. Verse 28, anyone who, di who disregarded the law of Moses died without mercy based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God, who has regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? That's three strikes right there, folks. That's 0 for 3 right there. Verse 30, For we know the one who has said, Vengeance belongs to me, and I will repay. Make no mistake about this. If you mess around with God, you play around with God, you reject God, you can expect God's judgment, and there will be a day that you stand before Him. There will be a day that all of us stand before Him. He says, Vengeance belongs to me, and I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. Verse 31, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Would you pray with me, church? Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, this is indeed a very powerful text and a very powerful warning. And I pray that today as we unpack your truth, that you would open our minds, our ears, our hearts to listen, to hear your word and to let it have an effect, to let it impact our lives, that we might heed your warning, that we might follow you in faith, believe in you, and trust you to guide our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all of the church said, Amen. Amen. I told you it was pretty intense. I told you it was pretty severe. The writer of Hebrews wraps up this chapter on perseverance by giving us a very severe warning. If you remember last week, we're talking about this, this section of the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews that focuses on persevering, enduring, right? Holding on to the confession of our hope. If you were here last week and Pastor Chris preached here, he looked at, 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 at the previous verses and in verse 23, what did it say? It said, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. That's where Pastor Chris talked about that sometimes people know his salvation story better than they know theirs because he shared it so much. And he talks about when he came to faith at um, Howard Payne and, and, uh, and gave his life to the Lord in, in, in faith. And, and that was his confession of hope. We each have our confession of hope if we have trusted in Jesus for the salvation of our soul. Think back to that moment that God saved you. Think back to that moment that God called you and you responded in faith and you believed in the Lord Jesus for the salvation of your soul. That was the confession of your hope. And the writer of Hebrews in the previous passage says, hold on to that. Don't waver. No matter what comes your way, no matter what persecution you're enduring, no matter what opposition you're facing for claiming the name of Jesus, Hold on to the confession of your hope. So now the writer transitions and he gives us this warning and he's wrapping up this section on persevering by giving us this serious warning. And the thing about this warning, please hear me as we read it, as you read along with me, as I read it out loud, this is not a hard warning to understand. We can understand it. That's why we know it's intense. That's why it's like a punch in the gut when you read it. It's not 
hard to understand, but it's difficult to swallow if you're playing games with God. If you're playing games with God, if faith is a joke to you, if faith is something that you compartmentalize and it's just a part of your life, something you, you wear on the outside so people you will think somewhat good of you, but you have no interest in following Jesus and your life shows that you have no interest in following Jesus, this is exactly who the warning is for. You see, it's easy to read in verse 26 when the writer of Hebrews says, we, he uses the word we. Look at verse 26. What does he say? He says, for if we deliberately go on sinning, it's easy to read that and think he's speaking to believers. But he's not speaking to believers because look at the rest of the passage and what he describes that those people do. They trample on the Son of God. They, they, they ignore his blood and they reject the Spirit of grace. That's not what a believer would do. And just in case you're still not convinced, we're not going to go through it today, but later in the chapter in verse 39, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear he's not speaking about himself. He's not speaking about believers. He's speaking about unbelievers who are pretending to be Christians. He's talking, not talking about atheists who have flat out rejected God. He's talking about people who might look like Christians on the outside, but their hearts have never belonged to Jesus. They're just playing a religious game. That's who he's speaking of, and that's who the warning is for. He's not speaking to believers today. You say, well, if he's not speaking to believers and he's speaking to unbelievers, he's speaking to basically uh, people we could call posers that are posing as Christians, but they're not really Christians, then really, why should I listen to you, Louis? Because even if a message in Scripture is directed to non believers, we as believers can learn from it and we can get learn from that warning and it can motivate us to share the gospel. Amen. So God's word is always good for all of us, no matter what, but make no mistake in this passage, the writer of Hebrews is writing to those who are posing as Christians, but really aren't Christians. You see, an authentic Christian is not perfect, but strives to live a life of obedience to God, not to get salvation because you already have it. So now you want to honor God through your obedience. And an authentic Christian is going to persevere, is going to endure with faithfulness in the face of persecution and opposition. One of the themes that we've been looking at through the book of Hebrews is that this first century church was under severe oppression. They were under opposition. They had obstacles they had to overcome. And in that culture, it was basically very similar to many cultures around the world. Pastor Nick prayed and gave God thanks that our nation celebrated another birthday this past week. And we truly have a lot to be grateful for because when we think of persecution as American Christians, we think about persecution differently than Christians around the world from us because a lot of Christians around the world, when they put their faith in Christ, they have basically taken on a death sentence in the country that they live in. And, and, and their lives, it could, it could cost them their life to make that declaration. Now, let me be clear on what I mean by that. All Christians, when we come to Jesus, it's a death sentence because we have died to ourselves and we find life in Christ. Amen? We're dead. Jesus raises us from the dead and he gives us new life. What I mean is that Christians in other countries, they don't have the freedom to worship the way you and I do. Literally, when they place their faith in Christ, it could physically cost them their life in that moment if they were to be found out. They understand persecution in ways differently maybe than you and I do because we are free to gather in this beautiful worship center, lift up high the name of Jesus, and sing to our heart's content uh, the name of Jesus that is above every name. Amen? What a blessing we have to freely gather and to freely worship Jesus. It's a hard thing to hear that some who claim to be followers of Christ actually live like sin is better than Jesus. Remember, Jesus is better than everything. But there's people who actually live like sin is better than Jesus. Look at the title of the message today in, in your worship folder. When sin is better than Jesus. Are you kidding me? When sin is better than Jesus? But tons of people live that way. I lived that way for a while in my life. I was more in love with this world than, in, than with the kingdom of, of my king. If you're more in love with this world and you're more focused on the temporary things of this world than you are on the coming kingdom and you have your eyes on Jesus coming back, I want to tell you something's wrong. Because the Bible says that if we truly belong to Jesus, we will long for his appearing. We will long to want to be with him. As good as this world is, this world holds nothing on the kingdom of God and what is coming. But how would you know that unless you're in the scriptures? And you're studying the scriptures and reading the scriptures and letting them penetrate your heart. When the temporary pleasures of this world are greater than the eternal promises of God, I'm living as if sin is better than Jesus. And that is dangerous territory to be in. That's exactly who the Bible is speaking to. It's saying you have fooled yourself. 
Somewhere along the line, you think you became a Christian. You think you're a Christian, but you love yourself and you love the world more than you love Jesus. You love yourself and you love this world more than you love his kingdom. And that is a serious reality check, folks. It's as real as it gets. And if you're a Christian at some time or another, everybody has been there. You get to the transition as you grow in your faith. That I love Jesus and his kingdom more than I love this world, more than I love my own life. Because I've lost my life in him. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live the life I live. I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave his life for me. That's exactly what this warning in Hebrews gives us when we prefer the temporary pleasures of this world to the external promises of God. How do I know if I'm doing this? Pastor Louie, you got me kind of freaked out. How do I know if I'm, I'm one of these people that, that the writer of Hebrews is talking about who have total disregard for Jesus? Well, that's one clue right there. If you're worried about that, then it's probably not talking about you because the people that Hebrews 10 is describing is people who care nothing about the things of God. They have no fear about the judgment of God. They just want what the name of God can bring them in this world. They, they wouldn't give it two, two seconds of thought. So if you're worried about that and think about it, that's a pretty good indication already that that's not you because you're thinking about it and you're worried about it and you want to make sure, Jesus, I, I want to be right with you. I don't want to offend you. So how... What clues, what indicators do we have of people who live like this? Well, we see the first one in verse 26 through verse 28, and it's this. It's continual sin. Make sure you get this down. It's continual sin. It's somebody who has no problem continuing to sin. They don't think twice about it. They don't care about repenting. They don't care about offending God. They're going to live however they want. Church, are you hearing me? Look at what verse 26 says. For if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. If I continue to sin, if I do not heed God, if I do not heed his word, there is no sacrifice that covers my sins. I have rejected it because I continually want to live my way and not his way. I want to be king. I don't want to surrender to that king. That's exactly what verse 26 is saying here. We live in continual sin. Now, again, to deliberately go on sinning is, is not to sin just every once in a while because we're all going to do that, amen? How many of you, since you've come to know Jesus Christ, have stopped sinning altogether? Anybody? Huh? If you raise your hand, you just sinned, okay? Because we're, we're going to sin, but the difference is because of Jesus and the, his blood that he shed on the cross, our sins are covered, our sins are removed from us, our sins are forgiven. We're forgiven from the penalty of sin, but we're not removed from the presence of sin yet. And so there's times that we sin, but hopefully as you're walking with Jesus, those times are occasionally, they're not premeditated. You haven't thought about it. It's just the fact that because we have a sinful nature, our nature is forgiven, but we still have it. Uh, uh, it, 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 that we're going to sin from time to time. That's not what Hebrews 10 is referring to. That's not the type of sin that Hebrews is referring to. Notice what it says here. Look at the two different ways it describes the sinning. If we deliberately, deliberate, and go on sinning, continual. So this is deliberate sin, and it's continual sin. You're doing it on purpose. That means it's premeditated. You've thought about it, and you've compared what God says to what you want, and your way wins out all the time. And I don't care if I'm offending a holy God. I'm going to continue to do whatever the heck I want to do. That's what it's saying here. And so we understand that to deliber de deliberately go on sinning is to sin willfully. We sin knowing what God says and we choose to go against it. It's not an isolated incident. It's not once in a while. And it's not without thought, but it is continual. It's premeditated. It's deliberate. It's almost as if there's a joy in sinning against God. Have you ever seen this before? You ever seen people who claim to know Jesus, claim to walk with Jesus, but they seem to delight in sinning against God? I, not only have I seen it in others, I've seen it in myself. I was there for a while where I, 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 I said I claim to know Jesus, but I really didn't give two thoughts about what he wanted for my life. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And that's a huge difference right there because I can cloak myself under the name of Jesus. I can go through the motions. I can speak Christianese and I can learn the language. I can know the customs and I can know the traditions and all that doesn't mean a thing if my heart doesn't belong to Jesus. 
See, it's possible to be in a culture of Christianity. It's possible to know the traditions and the rituals and know when worship is. And it's possible to speak Christianese, sing the name of Jesus, and your heart to be far from Him. This is what Jesus meant when He said of the Pharisees, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This is not talking about atheists who flat out reject God. That's understandable, and you can see that, and we pray for them and pray they'll get saved. This is talking about people who want to wear the name Christian but don't want to live a life that honors Jesus, don't want to live a life of obedience to Jesus. This is the warning that the writer of Hebrews is giving us to those people because he's saying just as it worked in the Old Testament, that's what happens to somebody that rejects Jesus because what do we read there? Whoever, what? It says, Anyone who disregarded the law of Moses died without mercy, who disregarded it, didn't give a second thought to it. As a matter of fact, in Numbers 15, verses 30 and 31, this is what the Bible says about that time. It says, but the person who acts defiantly, think about that, in defiance of God, whether native or resident alien, blasphemes the Lord. To blaspheme the Lord is to speak against God, to live against God. That person is to be cut off from his people. He will certainly be cut off because he has despised the Lord's word and broken his command. His guilt remains on him. If you have despised the Lord's word, if you care nothing about following God, even though you've been in church every Sunday, even though you can go through the motions of it, why would you ever expect to hear anything from God except, depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. But didn't we prophesy in your name? Depart from me. I never knew you. But didn't we go and and, and share the gospel with people? Depart from me. I never knew you. But didn't we go and and render aid to folks and, and do things in your name? Depart from me. I never knew you. You can do all those things and still not know Jesus with your heart. And while all those things are great, none of those things will get you to heaven. The only thing that gets us to heaven is Jesus. Did you notice what it says in verse 26? It says that these people who deliberately go on sinning have a knowledge of the truth. Did you get that? They have a knowledge of the truth, which means they don't have the truth. They just have knowledge of it. They've heard about it. They can tell you about it, but it's not real in their life. They have a knowledge of the truth. But like I said before, truth is not a concept. Truth is not a strategy. Truth is a person. They have knowledge of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. So they can tell you the stats. They can regurgitate information. They can go through the motions and look like Christians. It doesn't mean that they are. A lot of people, I've said this before, a lot of people treat the Bible like they do a baseball card or a football card because they'll read the stats about Jesus and they can quote you the stats. I can pull out the fa- the, my, my favorite player's football card and I can flip it and I can tell you where they were born, how much they weigh, where they went to school, their stats for last season, where they live now. I can tell you everything about them. It doesn't mean that I know them. I know about them, but I don't know them because if I showed up at their house, knocked on the door, and I said, hey, J.J., let's get together, open up the, uh, turn on the barbecue. I'm talking about J.J. Watt. Come on now, all right? I said, you know, J.J., uh, man, light up the pit. J.J. would call the cops. He'd say, there's some freak at my door. I don't know this guy, but I know him. That's how a lot of people know God. You know the stats. You've heard the stats. You can talk about the stats. Oh, I know Jesus lived some 30, 33 years on this earth. I know he died on a cross. I know he was born in Bethlehem. I know he did miracles. I know everything about him, but you don't know him. And there's a huge difference, church, between knowing about your Savior and knowing your Savior. It's somebody who grows up not knowing their father. They have knowledge that they have a father, but they don't know their daddy. Does that make sense today? Okay, you know you have a father somewhere, but you never knew him. That's how a lot of people know God. I know there's God somewhere, but I don't know him personally. And this is the warning in the book of Hebrews. Don't be that person. Don't be the person who's just going through the motions because the Bible has a word for this type of person, this type of action. It's called apostasy. And this is an apostate that Hebrews 10 is talking about. An apostate is someone who lives in rejection of Christianity, but has knowledge of it. And they claim it but it was never real. It was never really something that took hold of them. It's, some, it's having that head knowledge of Jesus and, and his gospel, but not knowing him in your heart. You know, it's been often said by many preachers, many, many famous preachers. Billy Graham said it. Uh, many other preachers have said it, that the difference between heaven and hell is 18 inches. So what, what do you mean the difference between heaven and hell is 18 inches? Heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. You need to know this. Jesus taught about both. 
The Bible speaks of both. They're both very real places. If you know Jesus, you know you spend eternity in heaven. If you don't know Jesus, the Bible says you'll spend eternity in hell. So how can the difference between heaven and hell be 18 inches? Because that's the difference from your head to your heart. See, I can have head knowledge of Jesus, but it doesn't mean a thing. It's not until I know Jesus with my heart that I become his and that I'm saved and that I'm part of his family and that I'm part of his kingdom. And it's an amazing thing uh, that, that as, as we understand this, having head knowledge and heart knowledge, you know who's the perfect example of this? And Pastor Nick referred to him, Judas who was uh, one of Jesus' disciples, walked with Jesus for three years, sat under his authority for three years, saw the miracles for three years, and in the end decided, no, I'm king. I'm going my way. I want some silver. I'm going to do what I want. I don't care about following him. But he was called a disciple of God. He was around Jesus for three years. You want to talk about that? He had the best pastor ever, heard the best preacher ever, had the best, heard the best teacher ever, and his heart never belonged to Jesus. You can have all kinds of head knowledge, folks. It doesn't mean a thing if your heart doesn't know him. Your heart needs to belong to Christ. I love how Jesus put this in Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus teaches one of the most powerful stories, parables of the kingdom. When Jesus taught us things about his kingdom, he would teach in stories. He called them parables. The Bible calls them parables. And he taught in stories so that you and I could grasp concepts of his kingdom. Because if, if he didn't teach in stories, you and I, the, the knowledge of his kingdom would be woo, way over our heads. So he taught in stories to help us understand lessons about how his kingdom works. And so in Matthew 13, he teaches us the parable of the sower. You say, I really don't understand what that means. Yeah, I, I didn't at first either. But in the first century, primarily his audiences were agrarian. What does that mean? They, they understood agriculture. They were farmers. They understood what it meant to work the ground and get something from the ground. And so Jesus uses this analogy of a farmer, the sower, sowing seed. And so he said there was a sower sowing seed, and, and they would carry uh, seed in their, uh, around their waist in a, little, in a little pocket thing, and they'd take out seed, and they'd scatter it on the ground. And the seed represents the gospel of the Lord. And so we are to be sowers of the gospel, and we're to spread the seed of the gospel. And so in Matthew 13, he says that parable that the, the seed of the gospel fell on four different types of soil, if you will. So the first type of soil that it fell on was the hard path. And so it could not penetrate at all. So it was on the surface, and the birds came and they took the seed and they ate it. This is representative of people who flat out reject God, never wear the, the, the title of Christian. They're atheists, and they just reject God. The, the seed never even can get in. But then he said there was a second type of soil. He said this was the rocky ground. And on the rocky ground, there was an immediate level of soil that the seed could get into, but it could penetrate no further. And so then when tough times came, that seed never took root. This is speaking of exactly who we're talking about in Hebrews 10. This is speaking of the apostate. This is somebody who receives the gospel with joy. And initially it looks like Jesus has saved them and has done something, but it never took root. It was just on the surface. And when tough times come, opposition comes they flee and they run from Jesus. Church, are you following with me? Yes. Then there was a third type of soil, and Jesus said some seed was scattered among thorns, and it, and it got into the soil, but the cares of this world and the worries of this world and the stress of this world choked that seed away, and it never took root. And then there's the fourth type of soil. Those of you that are saved know what I'm talking about here, and I pray that this would be the condition of your heart. Jesus said, but some of the seed fell on fertile soil. And it was good, and it was ready to receive it. And not only did it impact the surface, it dug down deep, and it took root. And that's what the gospel hopefully does in your heart, in your life, in your soul, that the gospel of Jesus would take root. Amen? We don't want it to be the rocky ground that it falls initially. We receive it with joy, but when tough times come, we flee from Jesus. It never took root. We never belong to him. And it's an amazing thing that happens when our faith starts to fizzle when tough times come. Make no mistake, this, this idea of oppression and persecution didn't just apply back then, but it applies to Christians today. And in American Christianity, the, the type of oppression we feel is we fear being unpopular. And when we fear being unpopular, instead we choose to bow down to the gods of this culture, the gods of popularity and political correctness. And I flee from Jesus because I'm not willing to stand on the truth because I'm afraid of what people are going to think of me or what they're going to say of me instead of standing on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, who is my Savior and Lord. See, the Bible shows us over and over that there are people who claim to be Christian, who walk with Christians, 
who never were to begin with. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. The Bible says, John says, They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. He's talking about people who purported to be Christians, pretended to be Christians, but when it got down to the real deal, they fled. They went out among us, but they were not of us. Because when times got tough, they took off. So the seed never took root. The authentic Christian life, the regenerated life, will show transformation and will bear the fruit that God wants it to. Make no mistake about that. If you belong to Jesus, your life will show transformation. God does not leave you where you are. He takes you as you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He's going to mold you into the image of his son. So the Christian life never looks like a flat line. Never. The Christian life always is ascending. It's always ascending because the goal of our lives is to grow into Christ-like maturity. Why? Because when we grow into Christ-like maturity, that brings glory to our Lord and Savior. And the goal of our lives is to bring glory to Jesus Christ. So we continually grow towards Christ-like maturity. And if your Christian life doesn't look like this, something's wrong. Because a lot of times it looks like this or it's stagnant. And there's no such thing as stagnation for a Christian. Doesn't mean you have to grow by leaps and bounds. Just steady, steady growth as you are letting the gospel seed take root. The authentic Christian life is one of perseverance. It's one of endurance. It's one of faithfulness. Can I encourage you to do something, church? Do what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul compared the Christian life to a race. And he said this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run this way. Run in such a way as to get the prize. How are you running, church? How are you living your life for Jesus? Are you just happy to be in the race? Or do you have purpose to your race? Do you have intention to your race? And do you have your eyes on the prize? Because for the Christian, the prize is not the ribbon at the end of the, at the race. For the Christians, the prize is Jesus. And we keep our eyes on Jesus as we're running. And we keep our eyes on Jesus as we're living. Because we keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And as long as we have our eyes on Christ and we abide in Christ and we keep running, we're going to run the race to win. We're going to endure. We're going to persevere when the race gets tough. And what gives you the ability to endure? What gives you the ability to persevere? You have your eyes on Jesus. And Jesus makes it worthwhile to endure and to persevere. And I'm not going to run the other way. It's an amazing thing that happens. And let me just say something really quick. If you're sitting here, and I've scared you enough today, that's not my intention. If you're sitting here and you know you're a believer and you know that you have believed in Christ and he has saved you from your sins, there's no reason you should have fear in you right now because you know you belong to Christ and you are secure in him. Can I remind you that if you're a believer, he has not given you a spirit of fear? Can I remind you of what 2 Timothy 1.7 says? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound mind, sound judgment. So if you're sitting here kind of shaking, saying, is Pastor Louie talking about me? Again, if you belong to Jesus, it doesn't mean you're going to have doubts from time to time. Every Christian who's ever been saved has doubted from time to time. Every Christian who's ever been saved has had days where you don't feel saved. Can I get an amen, church? You have days you don't feel saved, but thank God we are not guided by our feelings. Thank God we don't depend on our feelings because our feelings and our emotions can deceive us. I'm grateful that on the days that I don't feel saved, and I even take that to God and say, God, I don't know how you could love me. I don't, I don't even know if I'm saved. God reminds me, and he softly whispers. He says, Louis, you don't go by your emotions. You go by the truth of my word. And my word declares that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you are saved. You will be saved. Now, did you do that, Louis? Yes, Lord, I've done that in the past. Then you are mine. Quit thinking that you're not saved. Go by the truth of God's word, not your emotions. Amen? Go by the truth of God's word and not your emotions. It's an amazing thing that happens when you begin to understand the truth of God's word. The truth of God's word. And we see here, there's a huge difference between isolated sin and continual sin. So what does that continue to look like? What does the apostate look like? How, how does he begin to, how does he live out this continual sin? Well, look at what the passage says in verse 29. It gives us three ways that, that the apostate does this. The first thing is an attack on the person of Jesus. An attack on the person of Jesus. What happens here? 
There's an attack on the person of Jesus. Look what it says in verse 29. What do apostates do? They claim to know Jesus, but this is what they really do. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God? You trample on the Son of God. Well, well, how do you do that? Do you understand there's a specific reason the writer of Hebrews chose this language? Because to trample on something, to lift your foot against something, was the ultimate sign of scorn and contempt and disrespect. And that's what an apostate does. They claim Jesus, but they disrespect Him all the time. They disrespect Him. They don't surrender to Him. They want to do their own thing, as I've already said. And look at how the Bible describes having a form of godliness but denying its power. 2 Timothy 3, 4 and 5 describes apostates like this. People who claim Jesus but want really nothing to do with him. They're traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. You know, the Bible even goes on to say avoid these people. And what it means by that is avoid their influence in your life. Avoid hanging out with them, but you don't avoid sharing the gospel with them. Because I got news for you. If you're sitting here and you're saying, Pastor Louie, I know you've assured us that if we belong to Jesus, we have nothing to worry about, but I know that I don't belong to Jesus. And I know that I've heard the gospel before, and it's just been my choice to, to never receive Christ as my Savior. Then I would ask you to, 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 to deal with God about that. I would encourage you, search your heart. And if you know that God is calling you to, to say yes to that call, because make no mistake about it, as hard as this warning is to hear, God is doing this out of love. He loves us enough to warn us of the coming judgment. And make no mistake, there will be a day that each of us will stand before God. We will give an account of our life. And when you stand before God, you're not going to be able to ask Pastor Nick to stand with you. You're not going to be able to ask Pastor Chris to stand with you. This was my pastor while I was on earth. He can vouch for me. He can vouch for me that I was a good member of BT. When you stand before God, it's just going to be you and the one who the Bible says his eyes are like fire. Just the two of you. And no excuse is going to matter. And God loves you enough to warn you. He says here they trample on the Son of God. How? How do they trample on the Son of God? They manipulate his word. Watch out for people who manipulate the word of God. How do they do it? First of all, they live in outright rebellion of it. I know what the Bible says, but I'm an exception. I can do what I want. Be careful because they'll twist God's word. That's what the enemy specializes in. And you'll twist God's word to make it say whatever you want for your convenience. You know that any of us can take a, 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 a scripture and we can twist it to mean whatever we want it to mean. That's why you have to study it in the whole context of the Bible. Because our itching ears will start making God's word say what we want it to say. And we'll start trying to make God's word bend to us instead of us coming under the will of God's word. Think about that. You know how we do that? The number one way we do that is we question God's word. That's Satan's number one strategy to get you to fall. He gets you to start questioning God's word. Did God really say? Did God really say? Did God really say that lifestyle is wrong? No, he just doesn't want you to have fun. He doesn't want you to be who you are. He doesn't want you to enjoy yourself. Did God really say, Eve, that you shouldn't eat from that tree? Well, he doesn't want you to eat from that tree because he knows that when you eat from that tree, you're going to be just like him. And he gets us to question God's word every time. Apostates manipulate the word of God, but not only do they do that, they mischaracterize his church. They don't give honor and respect to the bride of Christ. We, the church, the blood-bought believers, we're the bride of Christ. And apostates mischaracterize his church. They don't honor his church as his bride. They look to separate his church, not unify it. Jesus prayed that we would be one. Apostates always seem to want to bring division in the church. Because they don't believe. They want to get others to fall with them. They don't give his church the priority that she deserves. What do we mean by that? Ah, eh, church is fine if it's, you know, within reason. Yeah, we get to church when we can. Yeah, you know, it's okay. But I don't need church to worship God. Pastor Chris talked about this a couple weeks ago. Hebrews says, do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. We are called to honor his bride. We are called to be a part of his bride. 
Apostates treat Jesus' bride almost as if somebody, man, somebody were to come up to you and say, man, I really like you. You're a pretty swell guy. You're pretty cool. I'd like to get to know you better. I just really can't stand your wife. What? I mean, guys, how would you react? What would you do? That's how we treat Jesus. I want Jesus, but I don't want his church. Give me all of Jesus, but I don't need organized religion. Give me all of Jesus, but I, ah, this church, I can do away with that. Are you kidding me? They're, they're together. The church is the bride of Christ. But not only do we attack the person of Jesus, look at verse 29, it also says we attack the work of Jesus. The work of Jesus, what do you mean? Where did Jesus do his greatest work? It's right behind me in case you need a clue. Jesus did his greatest work on the cross. Why? He shed his perfect blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Notice what verse 29 says, how an apostate treats the blood and the work of Jesus. They, disre- they have regarded as profane the blood of the covenant. What? What does that mean? It means because they don't think Jesus is God, I don't think he's worthy of my worship, I don't think he's worthy of my surrender, I don't think he's worthy of my obedience. I am telling the world I think his blood is ordinary. And there's nothing ordinary about the blood of Christ. It's the most powerful thing you'll ever encounter. That's why Nick said that the Lord's Supper is the most expensive meal you and I will ever eat. Because it's the blood of Jesus, the body of Jesus, that was given for us on the cross. But the apostate says, I don't think that's worth anything. I think it's pretty ordinary. When you say that Jesus is ordinary, you're saying that he was a sinner. And you're saying that he couldn't cover you on the cross. And that is blasphemy. That is speaking in direct contrast to who Jesus is. But not only do they attack the work of Jesus, look at what else they do. Look at what verse 29 goes on to say. They attack the spirit of grace. It's an attack on the spirit of grace. They attack the Holy Spirit because they reject the Holy Spirit. How can you expect to have God's forgiveness if you reject the very one who wants to convict you of your need of Jesus? It is the Holy Spirit that convicts us that we need Christ. So to reject the Holy Spirit is to reject Jesus. To reject Jesus is to reject salvation. That's the one thing God will not forgive. Oh, pastor, I don't know about that. I've heard you preachers say God will forgive anything. You better believe it. This is the beautiful thing about this warning. If you've been playing games with God, if you've been rejecting God, it's not too late. You can come to him. And you know what you're going to find when you come to him? You're going to find a God who loves you and has open arms to receive you. No matter what you've done. There's nothing you've done that is so bad, that is so big, that is so great that he can't forgive you. His grace is bigger than your biggest mistake. But there is one thing God will not forgive. He will not forgive the rejection, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because that means you chose to reject Jesus in this lifetime. That only happens after you die, after you breathe your last breath. What have we learned in the book of Hebrews? It is appointed to man to die once and then face judgment. If you're still breathing, you still have a chance. If you're still breathing, it's not too late. But the moment you and I stop breathing on this earth, we will face God as our judge or our savior. And what you do with Jesus determines who he will be. You receive Jesus as your savior and Lord. You believe in him. You you see God as savior. You see Jesus as savior. You reject the Holy Spirit. You reject Jesus while you're on this earth. And you will see Jesus as judge. And you will hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. But if you belong to Jesus and you know you're his and you are secure in who he is, these are the words you're going to hear one day. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's happiness, the kingdom of God prepared before the foundations of the world. Well done, good and faithful servant. What did you do with Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? because they attack the spirit of grace. If you don't believe me, look at what Matthew 12 says in verse 31. Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, against Jesus. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. You continue to reject the Holy Spirit You can have no hope of salvation. There is no sacrifice for your sins to cover you. But everything can change with one prayer. 
Everything can change with one confession. When you call out to Jesus, when he's calling you to salvation, and you say, yes, Lord, I need you. I want you. I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Because unfortunately, the conclusion to this is the last point I want to give you today. Look at verse 31. Look at the horror of verse 31. When you reject the Spirit of grace, when you trample on the Son of God, you fall into the hands of a living God. You will face His judgment. Vengeance is the Lord's. And He will have His vengeance on His enemies. To reject Christ is to declare yourself as an enemy. Pastor, you're telling me all this stuff just to scare me. And nobody gets scared into heaven. Hey, look, I don't care what you think. I'm teaching you the Bible. And I'm preaching the Bible to you. And God loves you enough to give you a warning. Make no mistake about it. You will stand before him one day, as I've already mentioned. You fall into the hands of a living God. You know that verse 30 where it says, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. That is a quote from Deuteronomy 32. And in Deuteronomy 32, verses 35 says this, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. In time their foot will slip, for their day of disaster is near, and their doom is coming quickly. The Lord will indeed vindicate His people and have compassion on His servants when He sees that their strength is gone and no one is left slave or free. You get the promise of God's vengeance if you reject Him, but you get the promise of His compassion if you come to Him when He calls you. Thank God for His grace. Thank God for His mercy. Thank God for His compassion. Thank God that in His love, He made a way for you and I to escape judgment when He sent His Son to the cross to shed His blood and rise again three days later. Apostasy is not something to consider or something to live out because it is indeed a very terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. God loves you enough to warn you. Will you be wise enough to hear it and respond? Please don't trade the temporary pleasures of this world for the eternal promises of God. This world is here today and it's gone tomorrow. Only Christ and His kingdom will last for all eternity. Don't trade the temporary pleasures of this world for His eternal promises. Jesus is better. Jesus is better, folks. And I pray that you will know that today. Amen? I pray that you will know that. So let me ask you, as I mentioned, just because you're a believer and this passage didn't necessarily apply to you, you can heed its warning. Hearing this passage, how does it motivate you to take the gospel across the street, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to share with people who Jesus is? Let me, let me put it this way, church. If God answered today, this Sunday, all the prayers that you have prayed since last Sunday, one week, if God answered today everything you've prayed for the last seven days, who would be saved? How many people would be saved? Huh? Besides winning the lottery and Kawhi Leonard going to the Spurs, what else would happen this week? Huh? What would be answered? How many people would be saved? When's the last time you prayed for somebody to be saved? Not, not, not much less shared the gospel, but just prayed for the opportunity. Who in your family needs to know Jesus? Who in your workplace needs to know Jesus? Who in your neighborhood needs to know Jesus? Are you prepared for that encounter? God might put a, a perfect stranger in your path tomorrow. Are you ready? How does hearing this warning today motivate you to say, I have not just knowledge of the truth, I know the truth. I belong to Jesus. I need to start telling people about him. What about you sitting in that chair right now? As a matter of fact, as you're sitting, I'm going to ask you to stand. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask our prayer uh, warriors to come forward, our altar ministers. And as they come forward, I want to ask you, if you've been sitting there today and you say, Pastor Louie, I know as you've been preaching, God has been doing some business with me. And, and I don't know if it's that I've been playing games. I don't know if it's just that I've been consumed with other things in this life. But I definitely know 
I have not followed Jesus as I'm called to. I, I have not honored Jesus with my life as I'm called to. I maybe go to a church. I maybe wear the name Christian. But I've realized today my heart is not his. Pastor Louis, what would you tell me? It's very simple. The only thing I can tell you is this. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He's calling you. Whether you want to call it conviction, whether you want to call it conscience, whether you want to call it that feeling in the pit of your stomach, God is calling you to be his. Answer the call. Come forward. Come to Jesus. Don't let anything stop you. These precious people want to help you know how you can know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. If you've got something this week you're just thanking God for, you're just blown away at God's goodness and His blessing in your life, come and share it with one of our altar ministers. They want to thank God with you. If you have a weight that you've been carrying, a burden that you can't carry anymore, and it's just weighing you down, and you have a situation in your life or a circumstance in your life, there's no reason for you to keep carrying it when Jesus said He would carry it for you. Come on up and unleash your burdens at the cross. These precious people want to pray with you. The greatest thing you can do if you don't know Christ, if you've been playing games with God, make no mistake about it, He's calling you to be His. Come to Jesus and come forward. Let's worship.